Thank you all for coming. This is my distinct honor and pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor Santiago Lagar, who I've gotten to know more about, and he's really carved out for himself a wonderful career as a teacher of jurisprudence. He's given talks all over the world. He's a close protege of John Finnis, under whom he got his master's at Oxford in jurisprudence. So he's told me some very interesting stories that I'm going to remember <laughs> and tell my jurisprudence classes. Professor Lagarde graduated from the Catholic University of Argentina, which is a kind of a sister school of Catholic University of America. Uh, it's a pontifical university. And at 22, he went to Oxford for his master's, as I said, studied under John Finnis. He's been teaching jurisprudence for over 20 years, and has had stints as a visiting professor at Notre Dame, and has a regular uh, summer uh, teaching assignment in Kenya. And after talking with Professor Lagar, I realized that uh, I may have missed opportunities to be more international, but based upon his experience as a law professor being welcomed uh, in so many venues. So with nothing further, uh, I've asked Professor Lagar if we can tape this for posterity, which we are, and we'll have this talk to show our jurisprudence classes and our classes in constitutional law in future years. So nothing further, Professor Santiago Lagar. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Professor Ambrosio, and thank you, Seton Hall Law School, the Dean, and all of you for being here today. You know how some people are fans of, I don't know, the Red Hot Chili Peppers or a football team or a sports, and they gather around it. They have like groups or they have annual meetings or email groups. Well, that's more or less what Michael Ambrosio and, and I uh, belong to with regard to natural law and Professor Finnis. And in fact, that's how we met. I did not know Michael <clears throat> until fairly recently when I mentioned at a breakfast with a group of friends that I liked uh, John Finnis's work. And one of them, who used to teach here, said, well, you should meet my colleague Michael Ambrosio. As if, you know, you like Radiohead and you're now in some remote part of the world where no one likes the Oxford band. And then you find someone and you want to put those guys in touch which is what he did. So we met for breakfast in the West Village one time, which I found quite cool. <clears throat> and um, from there to here, maybe three years ago, the first time I talked, uh, David was there. Some of you were here, I remember. And now here I am again. Let me tell you, uh, so, so I'll tell you a bit about John Finnis today, but let me tell you right now, well, I won't, actually, I won't tell you right now. I'll tell you when I talk about Finnis, how it was that Michael Ambrosio came in connection with my thesis supervisor in Oxford. Instead, before I get there, and by way of introduction, I'd like to share with you that it is my submission that the debates around natural law to some of which I will make reference today, will be very relevant in the upcoming cases on abortion in the Supreme Court, especially the Mississippi one that will be decided in June, in which, for the first time since Casey, the court has taken up an opportunity to decide whether and how 
Roe versus Wade and what was left of it after Casey should be overruled. Now, if you think of Roe and if you think of the cases that led to Roe, most especially Griswold versus Connecticut, and you read the dissents in this case and even in Roe, you will realize that the dissents are accusing the majority in those two cases, Griswold and Roe, of making a natural law argument. Isn't it ironic that natural law supposedly being like the super champion of the pro-life movement is like the flag for a super permissive abortion decision in Roe v. Wade according to the dissenters. Why does the then Chief Justice Rehnquist accuse of natural law the majority in Roe? Why do Justices Stewart and Black dissenting in Griswold accuse of the majority there of a natural law argument? Because they don't understand natural law. So they think that natural law is about disregarding a text, for example the 14th Amendment, and doing justice according to what you deem is justice. And this is what the dissenters, rightly in my view, thought uh, the majority was doing in Roe v. Wade. Finis is indeed the champion of an understanding of natural law where texts, norms, in this case the 14th Amendment, <clears throat> should never be ignored or surpassed for the sake of the interpreter's views on justice. On the contrary, for Finnis's view of natural law, which he claims, humbly I say, rightly so, to be Thomas Aquinas' view, the text, in this case the 14th Amendment, is always the starting point. And then we'll talk a little bit about what natural law theory has to say about how to interpret a text, in this case the 14th Amendment, with the two references to persons. But there is a big segment of the divide in the abortion cases that has already said goodbye to us if we are going to consider the text the starting point. Most times they will deny that they will say goodbye to us if we do that. But when you read what they have to say, and of course abortion is but an example, you will notice that they pay little attention to the text, to the history of the text, to the original meaning, to the purpose the drafter had in mind, because what matters in their view, the majority view in Roe v. Wade, for example, as I said, is notions of justice that should never be trumped by a text. That's the idea. Of course, the whole movement towards the left of the spectrum known as critical legal studies in all its several variances and dimensions, they tend to sympathize with this view. They don't care much for, for the texts, the, the way a verb is used, the nuance an adjective may introduce, like do in due process. You know, it's all about trying to find undercurrents that pervade normative structures <clears throat> so as to identify what power is at stake and, for example, defend the weak, for example, or the poor, or whoever, but the text doesn't really matter for them in general. Now, within those for whom the text is the starting point and, and does matter, not all of them 
are natural law theorists. In fact, perhaps you naturally tend to associate this view of paying attention to the texts with positivism. This is one of the ironies. Justice Scalia, who was a practicing Catholic, a father of nine, the father of a priest, and in private, a champion of natural law, he was seen, and rightly so, as a positivist by the left, by the crits, because of the careful attention his originalism pays to, to, to norms, to normative statements, propositions in constitutions, acts, cases. Today, it's not the day to criticize this Jekyll and Hyde kind of situation we have in the likes of Justice Scalia. I'm sure the Fed Sock guys here, David and the others, wouldn't be altogether happy if I do that anyway. But I'll just uh, move on to, to the next group within this side of the divide, the side where texts matter. So firstly, the positivists and some originalists, for whom the text is not only the starting point, but the only point. It's what completely controls the outcome of any case. Originalism now in vogue, contrary to what happened when I was a student, where it was supposed to be some kind of radical right-wing conspiracy. Now it may be a conspiracy, but it's very pervading and extended all over, not least in the Supreme Court. Originalism in, in, in most of its um, instances is uh, not far, as I said when I referred to Justice Scalia, to the positivist view. As you know, some originalists, they look for the original intention, others look for the original public meaning, others care for the history of the term, but, but for them, at the end of the day, there isn't a difference between a historical inquiry and a legal one, legal interpretation. Legal interpretation boils down to reconstructing history. Whether you consider what the dictionary said, whether you consider what the discussions in the floor uh, were, whether you consider what was the meaning of a certain word in the commentaries, or Blackstone, or whatever, <clears throat> that will end up with a kind of conclusion that one can rightly characterize as historical. Historical, which means not moral. This originalism is like, is or purports to be morally neutral. It doesn't care or look at the consequences of the interpretation found out historically in the real world. That's a problem for some other people, they would say. And finally, within this camp in which texts matter, so we have first the positivists, second the originalists, and third, all these three share the idea that the starting point is the text, the norm, you have a natural law theory of law, which, contrary to what Chief Justice Rehnquist thought, pays close attention to the texts. And this is not only Finnis, this is also clearly Aquinas, for whom law is precisely an ordinance of reason, and by reason he means the reason of those in control. In a constitutional democracy, 
the legislative power, the executive, the courts, and when you engage in the interpretation of their law, you're engaging in their minds and what they, they've done, this act, this constitution, this precedent, this executive order. This is all natural law theory. The difference is that for natural law theory, this is not just a historical inquiry, but also a moral one. So now I move on to the next section of my talk on this person who renewed the view I have just put in a nutshell, Professor Finnis, and then I'll come back to the difference between interpreting norms merely from a historical point of view and doing it so morally. Finnis was born in Australia around the time Michael Ambrosio was born, probably in New Jersey, <laughs> if I were to judge by the accent. And then in uh, 1962, he traveled to England, to Oxford, on a Rhodes Scholarship and worked for three years under Professor H.L.A. Hart. The, if you want, re-founder of legal positivism. So some, some may think Finnis is on the normative side of the divide and not in the, on the critical side of the divide because he worked under Hart, not at all. He claims that his view is Aquinas' view and the classical view, and also Hart's. So, if anything, they were aligned. And the concept of law, Hart's fundamental work, published two years before Finnis arrived in Oxford, it's in many ways an exposition of Thomas Aquinas' views. In 1967, two years after he finished his doctorate in Oxford in constitutional law, his doctorate, Finnis was appointed at the University of California, Berkeley, to teach contracts and legal writing for <coughs> one or two years. And that was his first important exposure to US legal culture and at law school and when he was there at, uh, at Berkeley he was, did I say Berkeley? Yes. He was walking uh, in the library, he, he has told this many times, when he found two important things that more or less changed his life. One was Bernard Lonergan's 1957 book Insight, that's also something very dear to my dear friend Michael Ambrosio, Lonergan, big guy here at Seton Hall. I was at a class yesterday where, where the chair of the Todd Lonergan chair was, was giving this class and of course Lonergan was everywhere. I confess I didn't understand very much, probably not this professor's fault, but Lonergan's or mine. And then he also find uh, Germain Grisset's first book, had just come out and found it there and Grisset came like to be like a great influence uh, for John Finnis. For those of you who know the name this will mean a lot. During those years from the time at Berkeley until 1980, now he was back in Oxford after Berkeley, uh, during those 13 years Finnis wrote his first book, Natural Law and Natural Rights, and uh, he works uh, a lot uh, there in trying to resurrect the Aristotelian tradition and the Thomistic tradition from an analytical framework, the one he learned from Hart. And many of us really liked this, you know, a Catholic, a convert, writing in English, writing about Aristotle and Aquinas, but using the tools of J.L. Austin and H.L.A. Hart. So one of us who was delighted with this was Michael, who shortly after the book was out, as he was, I think, on his way to a sabbatical from here in Florence, he was in Oxford, saw the book, bought it, 
and then read it for the first time. He probably read like 20 times by now. I think he knows the book better than Finnis. And around that time, Michael told me that he met Finnis in Philadelphia at a conference. They, they, I think they met uh, doing the groceries at a supermarket. Well, shortly after, Finnis was here lecturing, giving the commencement speech for Seton Hall. I told Finnis that I was coming uh, to meet you today, and he remembered he had come here around 1985. You were not born, guys, were you? 97. Yeah, no, Michael was born. The ladies were not born. And uh, he came to talk about his forthcoming book on nuclear deterrence, which was very controversial, as he, as he was completely against the US policy and the Russian policy on nuclear deterrence. And his impression was that his um, arguments were not received very warmly here, which, which Michael confirmed at some point. His work uh, in both books, and in, in, in one he published in 1982, Fundamentals of Ethics, was received with suspicion, especially in the United States. They thought some, some authors, especially reviewers, very influential, Father Fortin, Ralph McInerney, they thought this guy is a Kantian disguised as a Thomist. So they, they didn't appreciate very much um, natural law, natural rights, and that didn't help very much, you know, when you, when, when you get started like that, maybe some people just won't read you because so-and-so said like this, you know. So for a while, Finnis wasn't liked, of course, by the left, because he, paid, he was thought like a positivist by the left, a boring positivist like Kelsen or Hart, but he also wasn't liked by the Catholic world because of the influential reviews of the likes of these two I mentioned and several more who considered Finnis a traitor to natural law, a Kantian, like the worst kind of traitor. There was a doctoral thesis in 1987 at the University of Notre Dame written by Russell Hittinger, who I believe is now um, in Tulsa, Arizona. He, um, to delegitimize Finnis's work, he created a label. It wasn't a nice label, although it may seem nice. He said, this is the new natural law theory. Now, you may like to be called the new whatever, the new wave, but if you read the book, what he means by the new natural law theory is treason. You are betraying natural law, which is not true. From then, from Hittinger's book, Finnis's work and the work of his master, Risse, and his disciples became known as the new natural law theory which actually was not useful at all because for those who were even slightly knowledgeable that expression may, meant something bad, not good and Finnis never liked it or never accepted it but it really doesn't matter what matters is, of course, as usual you read what a person writes and then you make your own judgment it doesn't matter if it's new, if it's old In 1995, I met Professor Finnis um, in Oxford when I went there for my dissertation. As Michael said, it was an amazing experience. It came to happen as a result of a great disappointment. I must say, as I, the first time I applied, uh, my application didn't go well. I didn't make it. But um, thanks to that, I got to know Finnis better because he had written my letter, but the letter wasn't enough. And they, they had told him that if I applied again, 
maybe I would be luckier the following year. And the written sample of work I had submitted wasn't so good, they thought. So it occurred to me to come to Notre Dame, where Finis had just started teaching in the fall semester, three months every year, and work under him there on what would become my new sample of work, which later was published as my first article. So lots of good things happened as a result of that failure, as probably happened to you so many times. I got the first article published, then I got to spend more time with Finis, and, and more importantly, thanks to that long visit, I made ties uh, at Notre Dame that later in time, when I finished my work in Oxford, led to my being appointed a visiting professor there, which I am up to now. So, so sometimes like I look at God and I say, thank you for having that, that uh, failure, because otherwise none of this would have happened. I'm sure you, you know the kind of thing I mean. Right, so now after this um, detour, kind of biographical of Finis and of me, I go back to the natural law position when it comes to the interpretation of the texts. And let me say from, from the beginning that Finis has decided to get very involved in the current debate of the interpretation of the 14th Amendment. He has written two substantial pieces and, and an amicus brief for, for the Dobbs case. The pieces were published uh, in First Things and, and what he argues there, I don't fully agree with, I think, as he takes a position closer although not the same to Scalia's view. So, in my opinion, two positives. Because he is content with trying to identify the original public meaning of the term persons to decide if they are born are covered or not by that reference. And looking especially at Blackstone, but also at court decisions of the time of the ratification of the amendment and also at statutes of that time, he concludes that it is very clear that persons were protected, unborn persons, excuse me, were protected by the 14th Amendment there. Now, this may suffice if it were true that that meaning is clear. Of course, many people dispute it especially holding that there were some abortion laws out there when the amendment was ratified. But it also leaves unanswered and unaddressed the possibility that the conclusion could have been the opposite, namely that the unborn, the historical conclusion, could have been the opposite as it is for some, not for Finns, that the unborn are not protected by the 14th Amendment. In which case, what does this view say about such a historical conclusion? Nothing. It doesn't say, but this is unjust, so we need to apply Thomas Aquinas' considerations when we deal with unjust laws. So when the meaning of a term is unclear or is unjust is when I think originalism is not enough and is when I think natural law has traction, relevance for a scholar, for a judge, for a legislator, for anyone when it comes to ascertaining the meaning of a term, in this case, the term person. You know how for Aquinas, in the positive law, and 
therefore, in the positive laws, there are two types of norms, of positive norms. One he calls derivation by way of determination, the other one derivation by way of conclusion. In the first one, basically everything is about what the positive ruler or enactor decided to do because the connection with the moral natural law principle is remote. But in the latter, derivation by way of conclusion, this is a positive law, but the moral content is way bigger, so to speak, weighter than in so-called determinations. So derivations by way of conclusion are more related, you could say, to natural law. And this is what happens with the references to persons, in my opinion, in the 14th Amendment. So what I'm going to briefly argue now, you probably couldn't say it about a certain section of the bankruptcy law, where the connection with a moral principle, say the just distribution of, of debts, is looser and more remote. This natural law interpretation of precepts, of positive precepts that have a closer connection to natural law has to do, has to do, it's not the same, with so-called teleological, teleological, purposeful interpretation of the law. What is this enactment for? Why was it enacted like this whenever it was enacted? And, and, and for these purposes, to answer this question, of course, originalist methods will come handy and be very useful. But in many instances, and maybe in this one, if Finis is wrong, you won't have an answer, a clear answer. But the text is still there. So you need to find a point, a reason, a purpose for it that is truthful, that it makes moral sense. Norms are moral artifacts. They are looking for the common good of a community then, but then in time and now, in the present, when I am going to decide a case, right? So we look at the text and we, we think, okay, <clears throat> And we're talking about situations like this one, where the text is open to a natural law interpretation, right? This excludes scenarios that exist where the text defines and does it in a way contrary to natural law. For example, you protect persons and you clarify that persons in the 14th Amendment, this is a hypothesis only, doesn't make sense, does not include African Americans, or does not include the unborn. Well, if this is so clear, then there isn't much interpretation you can make. Now you are dealing with an unjust law, and you go back to Aquinas. What do you do with an unjust law? But this is not the case with the 14th Amendment and the unborn. It's neither clarified that the unborn are included, nor is it excluded that they may be in there? Which is why the originalists go to the past and some of them, like Finnis, think that they find this meaning that comes to protect them. I, I say if this were only a historical endeavor, that's perfectly fine, but it's not, you know? Here we, are, we have a duty towards the unborn if science tells us that they are not relevantly different from all of us in this room. And therefore, if I have the opportunity to interpret the text in a way that will be fair to them, I should. That's the view of the natural law reading of the Constitution as applied to this particular problem. Now, you could apply it to race, to equal protection, to whatever, right? Well, I think... Uh, I'm about to wrap up. I'll just um, introduce two final considerations, and as we have only 15 more minutes, I'll open it for questions if there are any. 
One is, you may wonder whether this natural law argument is a religious argument. Because after all, you see me arguing in favor of the inclusion of the unborn in the 14th Amendment, and isn't that what the evangelical movement proposes, and the Catholics, and maybe the Jews, and the Muslims as well? Well, but I've made no appeal to faith. So if there is a coincidence between the natural law argument and those and the views of those religious denominations, it's only a coincidence similar to the one that obtains when someone tells me theft is a crime under New Jersey law, and theft is a crime for God. Yeah, sure. I mean, there is a coincidence, but so what? I mean, New Jersey decided to make theft a crime. Then let us leave for the scholars of religion, the study of why it is that there are these coincidences when there are no. And then the other easy attack this position can come under is, isn't this a conservative claim? A claim for fets of people, kind of, or for the scalias of the world. And I would say that if this is true, if it is true in this example, because this would apply to anything, if it is true that the unborn ought to be considered protected by the 14th Amendment, well, then that truth should bind Democrats, Republicans, conservatives, liberals. No, no, but look at the statistics. It's like 90% of the people that support your view are conservatives. I don't know if that's true, but let's assume that's true. I would say, well, what can I do about it? I mean, that's not my reason. And you can conceivably support this argument without any political or religious affiliation behind. Thank you very much. Let me ask the first question, please. To what extent do you see the arguments of the Supreme Court? The what? The arguments of the Supreme Court that are about to arrive, having the potential for the natural law position you espouse being considered, not necessarily adopted, but at least being considered. Is there any sense that you have that that position you're espousing here is one that has any chance of being before the court as a consideration for their final decisions? So the question is whether the natural law argument that I reproduced or made has chances of featuring in the upcoming Supreme Court cases on abortion and others. I am trying to learn not to make prophecies and not to talk about the future because you never know what will happen. But if I were a gambler, which thankfully I'm not, I would bet like probably all my money that my arguments, these kinds of arguments will not make it into any Supreme Court decision, even one that might overrule Roe v. Wade, but rather the way they do it. But then who knows again? I'm like inconsistent here and I'm talking about the future. But I think if I were a gambler, I would say now put all your money in that they'll do it the originalist way. I ask that question because I'm just wondering, since you've had opportunities to have dialogue with John Finnegan, particularly on your recent trip to China, which you spent a lot of time with, have you explored with him that argument? Well, I don't know that I would be authorized to tell you what he said to me in China. But I can tell you that in his recent work on this, natural law doesn't surface. It's all a rigorous historical investigation of the 14th Amendment. And he thinks that that's all that is needed in this case. When he sent me a draft of this article, I 
I said, but what if what you discover is that the unborn was not protected? Well, that would be another article, he said. <laughs> yes, if you need Brian. Oh, yeah, so, uh, all right, so a little, I really enjoyed this, thank you. I mean, a little full disclosure, I, mean, I, did my, I did my doctoral work in theology with the radical orthodoxy people, so I will take a different tack on all of this, and you will, and I'm more sympathetic to the Hittinger sort of critique. Um, and I guess this would relate a bit, and, and I'm critical of the originalists for some similar reasons, I think, to you, because it does often seem like a form of positivism. But I would kind of, I guess, root my own natural law view of constitutionalism more in Augustine. So, you know, a commonwealth is a, a body of people bound together by the things that they love. And the fundamental law, the fundamental uh, law of consent, right, is that constitution that, that embodies those laws. Um, so, so, you know, why not a broader natural law sense that some of those other justices do critique, even even if I don't like you know the outcome in, in Griswold uh, or, or the reasoning, right, the penumbers and emanations, all that. But why not a broader natural law sense? Of, it's a fundamental law that embodies the fundamental consent of the people about what they love, and we can interpret it sort of teleologically from there to bring Aquinas back in, back into the picture. Yes, uh, I mean I'm I'm sure that that is. Certainly, uh, another way to go about it. And uh, if I would have again to gamble, I would predict that that way has more chances of featuring. Your way has more chances of featuring in a Supreme Court decision than mine, by the likes of Justice Breyer or before Justice Kennedy. I. I already explained yeah, to you. In fact, I can reframe it a little bit. Like, how, how, how would you uh, adjudicate, or how would we discuss together, like these different visions of natural law and natural law constitutions? How might we identify some of the differences and maybe try to try to bridge? Them? Yes, not not in a Supreme Court decision. No, no, sure. of course not. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that's what studying and scholarship and our conversations are about. I don't know. We would have to look closely at one another's arguments. Yes? Right? So, so thank you, uh, echoing David's remarks. Uh, I very much enjoyed this. So my question is kind of bringing this a little bit um, more particular to the question of judging in the American context, right? So is the methodology that you're proposing for a situation like that of the definition of a person in the 14th Amendment, what is the evidence that that term is built into the concept of the role of a Supreme Court justice in the American system? Or, to put it differently, that the I, I kind of took Scalia's argument on this a little bit differently in the sense that he was suggesting that the American regime's conception as a matter of positive law of the Supreme Court judge's role does not enable the move that you are proposing. And such his, his fidelity as a justice is to that positive law arrangement of which the natural law is potentially agnostic, um, uh, meaning that the conception of a judge in the American system might have the remote quality that you ascribe to the definition of person in the statute. But if the answer to that question is no, actually, in fact, natural law, as you're describing it, still allows this move within the American conception of a judge, but then isn't there a secondary question, which is, well, like, which natural law is baked into this interpretive move? Because it would seem to me that there'd be plenty who would say, well, sure, you can make the move to, deter to, to answer this difficult person to question, but we are in a uh, post-enlightenment, Lockean natural law world, which shuts off premises 
that are favorable to a Thomistic understanding of this. So there's really two questions, but um, hopefully you can speak to both of them. Thank you. I think I agree with you that uh, Justice Scalia would put it that way. He would say, I am not denying the existence of natural law and its possible relevance uh, with a view to interpreting what persons are, but do it in a law review article if you want to. Our courts are not allowed to. I suppose that's the kind of thing he would say. My argument <clears throat> is not about um, the US or about any country when I said what I said about the moral duty of a judge to interpret a norm that is unclear. He ought to, and there's nothing in the system, as far as, far as I can see, that will impede that from happening. Sometimes judges will say so, but I don't think that's true. So that it only boils down to how they do it. And which brings us to your second point. Of course, it, it's preferable, also from a natural law perspective, that this venture of going places using natural law to interpret concepts never happens. But it happens on occasion. Or it happens on occasion that the meaning of something is clear enough, but it's unjust, very unjust. Because it has been enacted that a slave is property, or it has been enacted that a race is inferior, and there uh, the Scalias of the world will also not be able to escape that situation. They might, but they shouldn't, by saying, I'm not allowed to question the law. The, 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 your, your question about natural laws or natural law theories, which is closer to, da it's close to David's, is like the, the eternal question about the truth in moral matters. Of course, what you're saying is correct. But what can I say? I mean, because there are plenty theories of what is right in moral matters, and we live in a post-Lockean world, I will renounce uh, the enterprise of trying to find out what is correct. So natural law doesn't really matter. In fact, I would never mention it the way Finnis does. You know, he wrote a 450 pages book called Natural Law and Natural Rights, and he never uses the term natural law. So that's, and then you could say to me, and this I would value, but you're wrong. That's the kind of, of course you could say, well, you cannot say something is wrong if you don't start from a, so it's never ending. Just a quick call, sure. sorry. So you use, interestingly <coughs> use the word off when describing that the judge can make yeah. a move that you huh. are proposing. So I guess just to drill a little bit deeper, that ought for you is in terms of the role of the judge is closer to a cardinal principle of the natural law. Yeah, it's a moral law. Yeah. Then, then, uh, so this is kind of contra the Robert. I think the George position, right, which kind of is more open to the yes, certainly. the separation of powers, kind of being yeah, I or filtered down. Yeah, in my article Not in the Louisiana Law sure. Review, which I sent Michael, called the new natural law reading of the Constitution, I flatly disagree with George about this. Thank you. Welcome. Did you have a question? Yeah. yeah I had a question. When I go one more in the back and then we go for the sake of time. But I'll stay here if you want to chat. My question was about a kind of the separation of powers thing that was just brought up. Okay. If we allow judges to interpret norms, yeah. doesn't that make them more of a legislative function than our existing understanding of a judicial function? Okay. Yes, I mean, this has been addressed countless times, this, this challenge, um, by the idea that, yes, they have like an interstitial legislative powers to fill gaps, but it's 
very different from the legislative power, which is open-ended, not constrained by precedence and so on. But I wouldn't, I think it's a, in my opinion, it's a waste of time to try to combat the notion that judges do some sort of small legislation. Yeah, it's with, that is within the judicial power from a moral point of view. Now, someone will have to show me, but I don't think it's easy, that the US system doesn't allow for this interpretation. I am not uh, from your country, but I certainly think it does. I know what you're talking about. Did you have a question? Yeah. Yes. yes. Um, <clears throat> to what extent can you said that uh, this view that we derive, um, that constitutional norms can be derived yeah. by international law, yeah. to what extent can we trace that to uh, Rousseau's theory of convention in the social contract? I don't know enough of that to answer your question, but if I were a gambler, I would say zero. As Rousseau is like, he's not a friend. Well, yes, please. I, I read recently that uh, there's been a very large gift made to Notre Dame for uh, a center on uh, originalism. And I was a little bit um, concerned. Uh, about the sort of Catholic and natural law and originalism becoming uh, equated. And so I, I wonder, and so your comments about the, your concerns with respect to originalism are uh, some of that I share. And so I, I, I wondered if you um, are aware of that, if you, if you know whether that is going to be tempered um, uh, but it, it just felt like a, a, uh, an embrace uh, that uh, needed some, some thought. Never heard of that, but since you, I think, teach law and religion, I'll tell you that there was a huge gift to do a law and religion clinic and a religious freedom clinic. About the other one, I'll investigate. I'm sure they need an enemy. Yeah, it was a, it was a, it's not the clinic, it's, it's definitely a Yeah, clinic. I didn't hear, but you know, you're sure it's not the, the Scalia school? No. <laughs> no, just kidding. I don't know, I mean, it, it, among my colleagues there, I only teach one month there every year, so most people, most things happen and I'm gladly not aware. But most colleagues uh, of mine there who do con law, they are full-hearted, originalists <laughs> and they either clerk for Thomas or for Scalia so we tend to disagree in part yeah David so you mentioned that when the originalist as a positivist conducts this historic inquiry this historical inquiry that it's not it's a moral concern that it's agnostic of morality but to what extent is there normative value in the project of originalism in, in only considering the text and ignoring you know, things that could ultimately be construed as you know, opinion, for lack of a better term? Yes, it's a, it's a good question. I don't know. I mean, um, the, the normative value of a project that I find hard to distinguish from a theoretical enterprise like history. I mean, history is by definition a non-normative science where you're trying to tell the story of something that happened and that's why they seem to be doing. Of course, then you can't get without the reality that when you use that history in a case, you're going to impact the lives of, now in this case, of thousands of people. So you can't just say like Pontius Pilate, oh, I, this is the history of the norm. I don't know. I want to 
thank you very much, Santiago, for a cogent account of how natural law can be the basis for a reading of the Constitution. And, and your balanced judgment uh, as to how you perceive natural law is something I'm impressed with. Uh, and I'm inspired to go back to read John Finnis's article entitled The Moral Incoherence of Positivism mm -hmm. and to see the extent to which he's changed his view, if at all. But at any rate, this is the kind of talk that I envision to be an essential part of the program of Catholic universities. Whether one believes in natural law or has a different view of natural law is really not as important as con confronting the question, are there objective principles that are discoverable to, reasons, to reason, which we should strive to understand and discover? And one might come to a conclusion there is no such thing as objectivity in this world, but I think the evidence is fairly strong that there is an objective world that we can discover. But anyway, that's my take on it. In the end, wish you well in your return to. Thank you. Uh, I hope to have you back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>